morning. It is so wonderful to be here with all of you. My name is Pam White. I'm the senior pastor at First Rowlett, and it is a joy to have the opportunity to worship together. Normally, on Father's Day, we would have the opportunity to be together in the worship space and to acknowledge the fathers and those who have been fathers to us. So I hope that you will hear us acknowledging you right now and saying that I hope you have a wonderful, happy Father's Day. I want to welcome each of you to this service of worship, whether you're a member of this church or whether you have found us online and have become a part of our extended community, we are really glad to have you here. It would be great if each of you could take just a minute to register your attendance. We've got several ways you can do that. You can comment in the comment section here. You can send an email to info at firstrowlet.org and you can fill out the form on the front page of our website. I say this all the time, but it never ceases to be true. It is important to us to know that you are here, and we're so glad that you're with us today. It's been wonderful to see the ways that this church has continued to stay connected and to stay bold in proclaiming the word of Christ, even in this time when we've been disconnected in some ways. And this week was a great example of it as we had Vacation Bible School. So many of you helped make this possible. I want to say a huge thank you to all the volunteers, to all of you who contributed in any way, especially to our children's director, Liz, and to her team for all that they did. We quickly pivoted, and instead of having a Vacation Bible School in the sanctuary, we were able to have a a parking lot parade that kicked this off, and the kids took home a box and had a wonderfully rich experience that you'll hear more about in a little bit here in this worship service. It is good to be the church together, and it is good to have this opportunity each week to worship. Will you join me? Let's begin worship today with our call to worship. Though we could be disgruntled, we come to give thanks. Though we could be complaining, we come to offer appreciation. Though we could be upset about what we lack, we come in gratitude for what we have. We enter now into this time of worship, carrying seed to sow, singing songs of joy, rejoicing together. Kingdoms once strong now. 
join me as together we affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we enter into our time of prayer, this morning we will again be using images on the screen. These images will allow you to see not only the names of those that we're praying for, but also will allow you to see all the ministries involvement in things that around the nation and our community that we all need to be in prayer. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. COVID-19 did not prevent First Rowlett United Methodist Church from offering a wonderful Vacation Bible School experience for the children of our church and of the community. Over the last week, scores of children experienced Vacation Bible School by taking home boxes filled with crafts, with game items, with even snacks, as Pastor Pam has already told you. Uh, the kids had a great time watching all of the videos, the stories, and the skits, and the music, and learning the, the choreography for the songs. And they used supplies that you donated. Thank you for your generous donations that made Vacation Bible School possible. Thank you for all of the volunteers who put things together and made signs and worked in the parking lot and put videos together that made this possible so that we can fulfill what God has called us to do in raising up a 
another generation in the faith of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your prayers for the children and for this experience for them. So let's see all of the great scenes and enjoy this video. This is my faith, this is my focus All of my days, I know where my hope is I live it loud, I shout the chorus Because I know, oh you're always for us And even when it's hard for me to see, to see I will trust in you, I will believe, believe And even when it's hard for me to see, to see I will trust in you, I will and keep on looking, looking, looking to you For where I'm going, no, you go there too I'll keep on looking, looking, looking to you i fix my eyes on you reminded that it is your generosity and your faithfulness in giving that make the ministries and missions of this church possible. Thank you for your faithful support. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we are grateful that you indeed are our source of blessings. You loved us before we even knew who you were. We ask that you take the gifts we offer multiply them, and help us to use them to teach others about the abundant life and the joyful life you offer to us through Jesus Christ. For it is in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
scripture this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 7 verses 7 through 13. When the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. The people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us and pray that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty voice that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were routed before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as beyond Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Jesenah and named it Ebenezer. For he said, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. The hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week we started this series that we're calling Then Sings My Soul. We're looking at some of the great hymns of faith, trying to either learn something about the composer or the story behind the hymn and to dig into the words of the hymn a little bit and learn a little more about the theology, some of the deep truths of our faith that are spoken through these hymns. It's easy to to hum along and to know the tunes and maybe just look at the words in the hymnal or on the screen, but not pay enough attention to what they are actually saying to us. And so it is our hope that during this series, we'll take a minute to pause and to consider the great truths that these hymns speak during worship and as we sing them at other times. And so we're going to do that today by looking at Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing a song that has endured for for many, many years. This hymn was written by Robert Robinson. Anyone who knew Robert in his younger years would be very surprised to know that he was the composer of something that is still sung and is still popular 250 years later. Robert Robinson was born on September 27th of 1735. When he was a young boy, his dad died. And so this had him growing up really quickly and contributing to the family income. An interesting side note is that his mom's family was actually a family of great wealth, but they didn't approve of her marriage to Robert's dad, and so they were disinherited. They felt like she had married someone that was below them, and so the two of them were on their own. Robert's mother tried to keep him in school as long as possible, but eventually he dropped out, 
and began working full time. She arranged for him to be an apprentice with a barber that was in London. And so in that time when you were an apprentice, you left home and you lived with that individual, spending all the time with them. And so this put him in a place where he didn't have a strong parental influence and he got mixed in with a crowd that wasn't a great influence. It was funny, some of the biographies that I read said that he became involved with a gang. Others said that he ran around with hoodlums. I didn't know gangs existed that long ago, but whatever words you use, you could tell at this point in his life, he was running with the wrong crowd. One day when they were running around doing no good, they came across a band of gypsies and began to harass them. And one of the gypsies that was said to be a fortune teller looked at Robert and pointed at him and said, you will live to see your children and your grandchildren. This was shocking news to him, I guess, because his father had died at such a young age. And so it made him really kind of straighten up and decide that he needed to change some things in his life if he was going to make that a reality. And so at one point along the way, he heard that there was this Methodist preacher named George Whitfield in town, and he wanted to go and hear him. But he didn't want his buddies to think he had gone soft. So he said, hey, let's go down and hear this preacher and let's laugh and make fun of those Methodists that are there listening to him. And so they did go down together. And Robert was greatly influenced by the words that he heard that night in George Whitfield's message. His heart was changed in deep ways as he heard the word of God proclaimed. And so for the next three years, he struggled. He struggled to understand what it meant to recognize himself as a sinner that is in great need of the salvation that is offered to him through Christ. Three years later, he not only went through a Christian conversion, but he also became a preacher of the word of God. Because of Robert's life path, he didn't have much of a, a formal education, but he was a great preacher. He took on this vocation willingly and began to speak this word to so many others. He joined this group of Methodists, and it was John Wesley himself that appointed Robert to his first church, which was the Calvinist Methodist Chapel in Norfolk, England. A couple of years after embarking on this new journey as a preacher, starting this new vocation, he wrote a hymn which expressed the joy that he had in this new faith. And it was called, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It was written in 18, I'm sorry, in 1758, when Robinson was only 22 years old. I'm sure he never would have imagined that those words that he penned just to express the joy that he had from recognizing God's love in his life would be alive and would influence so many people this many years later. Robinson was only a Methodist for a couple of years. He ended up connecting with a Baptist theologian and served for nearly 30 years as the pastor of Stone Yard Baptist Church in Cambridge, England. It's interesting to me because as a person who had no formal education, he was a pastor in a town that was full of intellectuals. He had so many professors and others from Oxford and they were greatly impacted by his preaching. Robinson even published a book on the history of Baptist in 1790. Last week we talked about Fanny Crosby who is said to have written over 8,000 hymns. And it's interesting to me that today we look at somebody that's so far at the other end of that spectrum because he is said to have only written two hymns and this is the only one that is lasting but the impact of this one is just as great. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing was actually written with four stanzas, but pretty soon after it was published and then replicated in hymnals, one of the hymn editors dropped the last stanza. And so that became popular to sing it with just the first three stanzas. And that's the way that we know this hymn today. And so what I'd like to do is to look at each of these different stanzas, each of these verses, and maybe pull a phrase out of it to talk a little bit about what it says to us. I know there's so much deep, rich imagery here. We could really dig into so many things, but I've been told that three-hour sermons aren't really everybody's favorite. They're kind of frowned upon. So we'll just limit it to one phrase per stanza. Let's start with verse 1. 
It says, come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. As I looked at this this week, it was the phrase that talks about tuning my heart to see God's grace that jumped out at me. And I thought a little bit about what that means and, and why it is that we need to pay attention to where our hearts are tuned. And it's because it's so easy to get pulled into so many different directions. We've got so many things calling for our attention, so many places where our hearts can be focused. And Robinson's words are a prayer to ask God to help keep our heart focused in the right place. As I was thinking about that, I thought of our vacation Bible school, and that's exactly what they were doing all week long. The theme was focus. And they were talking about what it means to focus on Jesus, to turn their hearts, to tune their hearts in the right direction. They talked about how they can see God's work around them, how they can hear from God, how we can talk with others about what we believe. They talked about prayer and what it means to talk to God. And finally, they talked about what it means to love others. It was such a great week, and I know these kids and their families as well were impacted by these different stories. Just because we weren't here in our worship center, they continued to have a really rich experience. We recorded some different sessions that they watched during the day. They had the same skits and storytelling. They had crafts and games and even snacks that were all in line with the theme for the day. And then at the end of the day, they had a Zoom session, and I got to be on several of those and just see the, the joy and the energy from these kids. You can't, you think a, a work Zoom meeting is difficult to imagine a bunch of little ones on there. They love to see themselves on the camera. They love to hear themselves talk, to dance, to sing, to wiggle, but the energy was wonderful. And one of the things that goes along with focusing on Jesus is focusing on caring for others. And so their mission was to collect school supplies. And they had a goal that involved uh, collecting a thousand supplies. And if they met it, their pastor was to get a pie in the face. And so that's how we ended Thursday night. I should have thought through that one a little bit more fully maybe as I made that offer. But it was fun to see the way that they were impacted by the lessons and by what this church did to make that event possible. Because the whole theme was about turning the focus towards Jesus, tuning our hearts in the right direction. And that's what Robinson's talking about here in this first stanza. Let's look at the second one. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. This talks about the sacrifice of Christ in this verse. But it starts with a phrase that isn't very familiar to us. It says, here I raise my Ebenezer. Who or what is Ebenezer? I'm sure that some of our brains immediately go to Ebenezer Scrooge from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, but that wasn't written until a century after this, and so it can't be that. Do you have any other ideas? It's actually a, a biblical reference back to the passage that Don read today. It comes from 1 Samuel chapter 7. So I want to back up and give us just a little bit of history there so we can understand what it is that is, uh, Robinson is referring to in this him. The people of Israel had been unfaithful to God. We see that throughout the Old Testament. And at this time, they had fallen away, and they started to engage in idol worship, and they weren't keeping up their side of the covenant. And so Samuel called on these people to turn their hearts towards God, to put away their idols. He told them that God would deliver them. And so they did. And we hear in this chapter seven about God's faithfulness as he promised that he would be the help that Israel needed. He would save them from the Philistines. And so when the Philistines came to attack them, they were not successful and the Israelites were spared. 
And so because of this experience, verse 12 tells us that Samuel took a stone and set it up. He named it Ebenezer and proclaimed that the Lord had helped them. In Hebrew, Ebenezer means stone of help. Eben means stone and Ezer means help. And so Ebenezer is not a person, it's a place. In thankfulness, Samuel set up this stone to commemorate God's goodness. This was a sign not only for those who were there to experience it themselves, but it was a sign that would be there for generations to come so that they could be reminded of the ways that God had shown God's faithfulness. It was a way of glorifying God and it also served as encouragement for God's people. So when we sing these words, here I raise my Ebenezer, what we're doing is this same thing. We're looking back and we're remembering the way that we see God's faithfulness in the Bible. But we're also proclaiming the ways that we see God's faithfulness in our own lives. And so I ask you this, what is your Ebenezer stone? In what ways do you commemorate the ways that God has been faithful in your life? It could be healing that you found from some medical condition, God walking you through a very difficult time, healing on some other level with a relationship or another difficult time that you were going through. God's faithfulness shows up in our lives in so many different ways. We recognize it at the time and we're often grateful, but too often we move on quickly to the rest of life. And we let those events kind of kind of fall back to the back burner, fall away from the front of our memory. And so looking at this this week, I was reminded of the importance of having something that captures those great moments. Some way that we pause and give a little extra attention, turn our hearts with gratitude towards the ways that we recognize God's faithfulness in our lives. It may not be an actual physical monument, but in some way to proclaim God's goodness that we ourselves have experienced. Think how valuable it would be to have the habit of creating our own Ebenezers. This not only serves as an anchor for us, but it allows us to share our faith with others as well because we are prone to focus on other things and that's what this third verse starts to talk about listen to verse three. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily i'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love here's my heart O oh, take and seal it Seal it for thy courts above. This claims the reality that no matter how hard we try, we continue to struggle on our Christian journey. Our hearts do wander, and we do turn away from God's love and God's grace. Robinson asked for there to be a fetter, something that ties his heart to God's, something that acts as an anchor. He's aware of his tendency in our tendency as humans to turn and walk away from God's love. And this fetter is important. The grace of God is not ours because of what we do to deserve it. We don't have to wait until things are perfect to receive the love and the gift and the sacrifice that comes from Christ. This is God's grace that comes to us. But God's grace is there for us regardless of what we do. That's what this verse is claiming. Regardless of how much I wander, God's grace is a constant. The sacrifice of Christ never ceases to be there for me. And so Robinson did continue to struggle throughout his life. He continued to experience this difficulty in wandering away and his heart wandering even after he was a preacher for so many years. And it said that he was in a particularly low place and that he felt separated from God when he found himself on a stagecoach sharing the ride with another passenger. It was a woman who was trying to kind of pass the time while they were on a long journey and she started to sing a song that was important to her. And she sang the words to this hymn. 
As she finished singing, she turned to Robert and asked him what he thought about the song. She had no idea that he was the one that had composed it. And he is said to have replied to her with a very honest answer that described just how low he was at the time. He said, Madam, I am the unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago, and I would give a thousand worlds if I had them, if I could feel now as I felt then. No one knows the the accuracy of this story, but it is said that she responded by telling him, Sir, the streams of mercy are still flowing. You see, she was a witness to him using his own words. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. This hymn reminds us that all of the blessings in our life come from God. James 1.17 says that every good gift, every perfect gift comes from God above. That's what's captured to me in this hymn. Streams of mercy never ending. God's grace surrounds us always. I love the imagery here of a fountain that continues to flow. Not something that turns on and off occasionally, but something that overflows. It's so full and so available. God's amazing grace flows around us continually. No matter how far we wander, God continues to be faithful. We just have to tune our hearts in the right direction to notice. Let us pray. Gracious God, our hearts overflow with gratitude for the love, for the grace that you constantly extend to us, for your faithfulness that is never ending. Forgive us for the times when we wander, for the times when we fail to recognize your presence, for the times when we fail to trust you. God, I ask that you would give us a fetter, tie our hearts to yours so that we recognize your love and your grace. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of Teach me so melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for the It is such a gift to have God's love and God's grace that is a continuous fountain in our lives. That's what we recognize together when we worship each week, and it's what we try to point each other towards as we walk beside one another in a faith community. 
If you are looking for a faith community for people to walk beside you on the Christian journey, we would love to have you as a part of First Rowlett. If you're ready to do that now, we would invite you to give a call on the pastoral care line. I would love to talk to you. Dretha would love to talk to you. We would love to include you in our family of faith here at First Rowlett. And so as you go forth today, I hope that you will recognize the ways that your heart is tuned to God's love and God's grace. May you be surrounded by the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.